Welcome to our continuing discussion of types of structural action. This is from chapter one, section six, and the point one applies to the tension. So we're talking about tension elements and in sort of general terms, I'll make uh, several comments. Tension elements can be very slender because they're not vulnerable to buckling, nor do they need any kind of lever effects uh, associated with the thickness of the elements. In other words, they're not functioning as bending elements. The connections can be very challenging and should never be underestimated. There almost always is a need for tensioning and adjustment mechanisms. Um, and the shape can be particularly crucial for spanning elements. And finally, they're fairly difficult to model. So when students think about going and building tensile structures, you need to think really carefully about how you're going to make the connections. Um, and also the material you choose. For example, most of our tensile members in actual buildings are high strength steel. Steel is a very stiff material. Um, there's a temptation for students to model structures with string. String is a very stretchy material and often very large deformations occur in the in the string before it actually becomes effective as a tension member and often that can produce other secondary stresses in the structure that can fail the structure before the tension member even becomes effective. So those are general comments about tension. Right at the moment we're going to focus on our second video having to do with tension which is dealing with cross bracing. So here we have a structure consisted of rigid frames which are responsible for spanning from here to here. Um, so from there to there under gravity loads and so they tend to be fairly substantial. They're also responsible for resisting wind forces either in this direction or that direction. In other words parallel to the plane of the rigid frame. The rigid frames work very well for those two functions. On the other hand, they're extremely weak relative to forces in this direction or this direction. In other words, perpendicular to the, to the planes of the frames. So for stabilization in that direction, we use cross bracing. At least we can do that, assuming we don't need to have penetration like large openings uh, through this portion of the facade. Um, it's quite striking that these frames are handling the uh, w forces in that direction parallel to the frame. These frames are extremely rugged and thick and yet in this opposite direction, in other words parallel to this, um, we have these unbelievably delicate cross brace members. These cross brace members, by the way, under a force in this direction, this member tends to uh, go into tension. This member tends to go slack. Uh, in order for the cross braces to work, though, they have to have a complete frame around them. So in other words, this member is a crucial part of the structure and has to be there. And you'll notice we have a whole series of purlins here that are fairly light. And then in this bay, we have a beefed up purlin which uh, accounts for that compressive action associated with this frame that we've created around the cross bracing. Notice the cross bracing is unbelievably delicate and unbelievably efficient and it can certainly let in cross ventilation, let in plenty of light. The one problem becomes the functional issue of do we need opening in this bay or don't we? This is another view of that cross bracing. You'll notice in this case there's also cross bracing, not all of which is visible, but there's cross bracing in the top. So in other words, not only is this point stabilized relative to the foundation points, uh, these points are by this cross bracing, but so that these elements, these vertical elements, won't flop in that direction or that direction. Likewise, these elements are restrained horizontally by these tension elements in the roof. We can see this in fairly low end buildings like this might be used for warehouses. In this particular case it's to cover tennis courts but we use these in storage buildings and warehouses and so forth. 
um, but you can also see cross bracing in high-end buildings. So uh, this is the Raleigh-Durham International Airport and there's cross bracing in the roof here. This is a somewhat better view of that. Um, we also see cross bracing here in the California Academy of Sciences. Um, this large overhang has a tendency to shift in that direction or that direction under seismic effects and it's braced against doing that by these cross bracing elements here. This is another example. Uh, here you see the cross bracing um, in this dome. So we have lots of glass. Uh, seismic effects cause lateral movement. So we have cross bracing there. And that's the interior view of that. So here is that cross bracing. Now you'll notice here we've got these quite elegant connectors. This is called a clevis and this plate has been dished out by forging it to account for the fact that all these elements are not coming in in a plane but they're coming in as uh, cord members across a curved surface which in this case is a portion of a sphere. Um, these you can't see it very well here but there is a screw mechanism contained in that. Sometimes uh, this individual member is a screw mechanism Sometimes this member has left and right-handed threads, so by putting uh, a torquing or a strap wrench around this, we can rotate it and use it to make adjustment. This is the same detail down at the bottom of that structure, where it turns out this is a planar element. Now, these tension elements um, need to be pre-tensioned somewhat because otherwise under wind shift, if, if the wind changes from this direction to that direction abruptly, uh, one of these members that was relatively slack will suddenly become very taut and it makes noise when it does, which we call rod banging and rod banging can be a concern. So we have to provide some counter tensioning or some tensioning elements, which we do at the base here. So here's that tension element coming through with a nut that's used to uh, accomplish two things. First thing is by adjusting these rods appropriately, we're able to assure that these elements are properly vertical before the walls and the roof get attached. But the other issue is we can use that to create some tension in these elements so that the structure doesn't move too much under shifting wind loads. Uh, this is the view from the other side. You'll notice this element, the nature of the shape is such that it accommodates uh, uh, any angle that these rods might want to come through. And it has to do two things. It has to have a component perpendicular to this web and a component parallel to the web to keep this thing from going up and gouging out part of the web. And when we look at that element from the other side, we see that it extends in and creates a nice interface here with this web material. So when it pushes up, it doesn't damage that web. Sometimes these uh, cross bracing elements are made out of steel cable. Steel cable makes it even more crucial that there be adjustment mechanisms because steel cable comes with wiggles and it's not fully tensioned. In other words, the strands aren't always bunched together as tight as they can be and they will become bunched together under tension but there'll be elongation that's associated with straightening them out. And so uh, some kind of adjustment mechanism is necessary. And to illustrate this problem with non-straight tension members, I'm going to show the next image. It's, a not, it's not a cross bracing situation but it illustrates how steel strand or steel cable may not be straight. So here we have a steel element coming down under this kingpin and then going back up on the other side. And I think you can see some wiggles in that cable, which when it's finally fully loaded, those wiggles will all disappear. But that means some movement has occurred. And if we want the building to be fairly stable in the case of uh, this cross brace situation, um, 
We don't want one of these things stretching out substantially after the building's already built. We want to get that uh, ductile behavior or that stretching out before we actually uh, put the building under service load. Um, and here's another couple of examples. You'll notice a fairly major crook in this cable. And here we have a crook there and another crook and another crook. All those things would get straightened out uh, once a substantial load is put on these tension members. So that concludes our discussion of cross-bracing tension members.